Right. Hi again, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the latest event in our spirituality series. My name is Jessica Colligan, and I'm happy to welcome you on behalf of Fairfield's Alumni Relations Office. With me this evening are Father Jim Bowler, who many of you know from his decades of service to the Fairfield community, and Father Frank Hanafy, who was also a member of our community for many years, and he is now in Philadelphia at Old St. Joseph's Church. We are so grateful and really very lucky that both of them have stayed connected to and involved with the university, and we're just so happy to have both of them with us tonight. Before we kick things off, I want to ask that you please make sure your microphones are muted to minimize any distractions, and I also recommend that you use the speaker view in Zoom rather than gallery view just to make sure that your screen stays focused on our featured speakers. And finally, we encourage you to use the chat. If you have any questions for Father Hanafi, we will do our best to get to as many of them as possible, if time allows, at the end of the conversation. And now I will turn things over to Father Bowler. Thank you very much. It's actually a pleasure for me to interview Frank tonight. I would just like to make, I, I knew Frank very well when we were at Fairfield. I'd like to just stress three points about him that, really impressed me. One was his competence as a theologian and as a professor and how seriously he took that. But then he had a certain balance in his life. There was the artist and something that he did extremely well. And finally, there was that Jesuit Majus, the effort he put in in learning Chinese so he could go to China. So you couple those three things and you encounter a rather extraordinary Jesuit. And so Frank, let me begin by saying, asking you the question, how did you meet the Jesuits? Thank you very much, Jim, for that uh, very kind introduction. And also just uh, before I uh, talk about how I first met the Jesuits, just would like to thank all of you for coming tonight. Uh, it's very wonderful to see uh, so many of my uh, Fairfield friends a special thanks also to Jessica uh, Colligan and also to Janet Canepa for inviting me uh, tonight. How did I meet the Jesuits? Um, Jim, how long do you have? Uh, I, I would say, <laughs> uh, actually, uh, my uh, way into the Jesuits and meeting the Jesuits uh, might have been somewhat an indirect path, I, I might say. Um, for example, I never went to a Jesuit school or uh, Jesuit parish uh, growing up. Um, in fact, uh, I would say that my vocate, what, what I felt or at least experienced to be uh, the early uh, movements or inklings of a vocation for me probably got very serious when I was about a sophomore uh, university student. And um, I uh, wrote a letter actually to the Jesuits um, expressing what I thought was some interest. Interestingly, I, I initially for me, it was kind of feeling a call to the priesthood. But, and I was maybe considering the diocesan uh, uh, group. And then there were a couple other groups I was looking at. Um, and uh, for example, the Holy Cross Fathers who were at Notre Dame. And then, and then I wrote to the Jesuits um, in Boston. And I a couple of weeks later, I got a letter from the one and only Father Joseph McCormick, who many of you may know, who was at Fairfield for many years. And I was a student up in New Haven and uh, at uh, the State University up there. And um, uh, he said, I was, I'm coming down to Fairfield, uh, Connecticut. Uh, would you like to come down and, and meet me and have a conversation? So I, I said, sure. So I the first Jesuit I ever met, actually, was Father Joseph McCormick on Fairfield University's campus, which is, when I think about how my, the trajectory of my life, how, um, uh, how fascinating that was, because um, I ended up, of course, spending many years at Fairfield. And in fact, I can even remember the first place I, I met him, and that was in the old Bellman Hall, which, when it was serving as the Jesuit community, and I, I met Father McCormick there and uh, uh, in what I think in the old days was maybe the library. Uh, and then um, uh, we had a lovely conversation. I, I was 
telling him all the things I thought I wanted to do with my life. And then he listened very patiently. And then he just looked at me and had one question and said, do you pray? <laughs> and uh, anyway, after that, he invited me to um, uh, enter the Jesuit candidacy program. And, uh, and at that time, I got to know a couple of Jesuits by attending some of those meetings. And then, uh, my, believe it or not, my spiritual director before I entered was a very well-known Jesuit in the New Old New England province, Father uh, Jack Post, Father John Post, um, who was injured in the, the Great Shadowbrook Fire. And uh, he, at that time, was at Fairfield. And I remember I would drive down from New Haven and, and visit him occasionally when I was still a candidate for the society. And, um, and that kind of led me into it. I, I uh, took my time. I, I graduated from college. And then I think about a year and a half after I graduated from college or so, then I entered the Jesuits and uh, went into the novitiate in Boston um, at uh, the, uh, the infamous 300 Newberry Street, it was where we had our novitiate in those days. So basically, I, I kind of entered the Jesuits through uh, some personal contacts with uh, Father Joe McCormick, Father John Post. And uh, then I began to meet some of the other guys uh, in those days uh, who were interested in the Jesuits. So again, my case is a little unique in that I never went to a Jesuit school, never went to a Jesuit parish. But I think one thing that really attracted me to the Jesuits was the kind of work they did, um, both in education and in missionary work. And... Um, I found them just to be really impressive guys. And uh, um, so that's kind of how I entered. And uh, I was uh, one of my classmates, maybe some of you may know him because he does have some Fairfield U ties. Uh, I entered the novitiate on the same day with Father Andrew Garavel. Uh, he and I were novice together at 300 Newberry Street. And he and I were everywhere in the society together until we were sent off to theology. And sometimes they used to call us the Frank and Andy show. <laughs> we, were, we became good friends and still are. And uh, some of the other guys I was with, Father John Savard, Father Greg Chisholm, um, and uh, a, whole, uh, a whole interesting list of people. But uh, that's kind of the short version of how I found my way in uh, to the Jesuits. And, um, you know, what's the old saying? Um, uh, I'm not sure what I would, I think of a group that would have someone like me as a member, uh, but it's, it seems to have worked out, you know, uh, uh, I, I've been a Jesuit since 1981. I was ordained to the priesthood in 1993. I spent um, a good number of years at Fairfield. I was in Chicago in Berkeley, California. Um, and then, uh, down in Central America for my novice experiment in Belize, which was formerly uh, British Honduras. And then, uh, and then I, I started getting interested in China, but I think we'll talk about China later, but I, I spent time both in Hong Kong and in Beijing and other parts of China. Uh, but, um, but probably my home base, um, uh, definitely my home base uh, as a Jesuit where I've spent the longest uh, amount of time, maybe aside from studies, being in school forever, but uh, uh, was at Fairfield and Fairfield University. In fact, I had uh, two uh, major assignments at Fairfield. Uh, my regency period was at Fairfield from 1986 to uh, 1989, I believe it was. And, um, and then I returned after um, uh, graduate studies and after ordination graduate studies. And I began teaching in the uh, religious studies department in 1998. Uh, so Fairfield has in many ways been my home in the Jesuits in the U.S. And I have, a, uh, I still can't believe I'm not there. Sometimes I wake up in the morning and I kind of, uh, maybe this was after dealing with jet lag from China. The first few minutes when you wake up you're, uh, after flying back and forth to China, you're not really sure where you are. And sometimes I almost feel like I'm back at Fairfield, but I'm here in Philadelphia now. So let me uh, ask you this question, okay, because you made a decision to get a doctorate in theological ethics at Loyola. What was behind that decision, Frank? And can you say something about your doctoral work in preparation for coming to Fairfield? 
Sure. Thank you, Jim. Sure. Um, you know, it's funny. I think in many ways, my academic uh, kind of interest began, uh, well, ultimately, I think it began in my family. My parents always encouraged us, you know, in studies and learning. Um, and uh, I, when I was an undergraduate, I, uh, I had a double major in economics and in religious studies. And um, kind of an unusual combination, of course. Um, and uh, after my philosophy studies in Chicago, after the novitiate, the Jesuits gave me the uh, uh, permission to go and get a, uh, an MBA degree, which I did in Chicago um, in finance and marketing. That was like a two-year program, two-year full-time program. So I went from philosophy into MBA studies um, because I, I really thought I kind of felt drawn and attracted to business people and wanting to figure out a way to somehow minister to business people. Um, my father was a business person and I, many of my uh, uncles and aunts and my, my two brothers went into uh, business and a uh, business was always kind of in my life. Um, and um, I felt drawn to business people for many ways for their, to their creativity and their focus and all, and also their importance in the world. So I somehow, I really think it came out of my prayer ultimately, but, but I, I felt this kind of attraction to, um, to learn the language of business, if you will, and of finance and marketing. So I went off and did this uh, MBA program. And when I was in the uh, MBA program, and then when I was teaching at Fairfield back in the business school as part of my regency, um, I began to feel drawn to uh, questions of business ethics. In fact, I see my friend and colleague, uh, Larry Vitalano and Donna. Larry and I have done some uh, research uh, together in business ethics over the years. And so this interest in business ethics got going um, and um, that kind of, uh, kind of continued for some years. So then um, when I went out to Berkeley for uh, theology studies prior to ordination, you know, I took some really good courses in uh, Catholic social thought um, uh, with uh, John Coleman and others. And I began trying to look at in my own reading and writing in the, the intersections between, you know, the church's mission uh, in the world and in economic life. I mean, certainly one of the things that, um, you know, Catholic social teaching has to deal with, has to do with is, um, you know, addressing questions of, of uh, the social and economic and political dimensions of, of the world and human life. And so I got very interested in those questions and I became very interested in questions of economic justice and, um, and I wrote my, I, I was very captivated by the U.S. Bishop's pastoral letter on the U.S. economy that came out in 1986, uh, Economic Justice for All. In fact, I wrote uh, one of my um, uh, theses in Berkeley, my so-called fourth year thesis on, on that, on the principle of participation uh, in, uh, uh, in Catholic social thought. So while I was in uh, both in Regency and also in uh, theology studies, I just became very interested in questions of economic ethics and business ethics. So um, I wanted to continue with it. And on one level, it seemed a little crazy because at that point, you know, uh, you know, you sort of are in studies forever. You know, at that point, I've been in formation for like, seven, you know, oh, how many years? Gosh, I, I, I think it was like about 17 years or something. And then, um, that, but then I decided that I really wanted to do, um, to get a PhD in, um, in, in theological ethics so that I could find a way to um, work with business people. And, and on another level also help the church, I think, um, and the Jesuits be able to be in dialogue with, um, you know, those kinds of questions and to be able to you know, deal with those questions. So anyway, I went off to um, uh, Loyola Chicago and I, I did a degree there uh, in theological ethics with a, a focus on business ethics. And I had a, 
you know, uh, uh, both my program was both in the theology department and the in the graduate school of business. I worked a lot with this guy, uh, John Boatwright, uh, who was the Raymond Baumhart professor of uh, business ethics at Loyola Chicago. I ended up using his book for many years at Fairfield in uh, business ethics and, you know, taught uh, pretty much every year um, the, uh, the course in business ethics for Fairfield U students. So anyway, it kind of, it, uh, Jim, I guess that's a long answer, but I would say that it um, uh, just a kind of a number of things came together in my formation, um, uh, both academically and also in the Jesuits. And quite frankly, another part of it for me was, you know, when I was down in Central America and then when I was in Berkeley, there were just, you know, the problems of homelessness, for example, and uh, which is a huge problem here in Philadelphia uh, right now, uh, we're the, very near to where the church uh, is right now where I work. So I think it was both um, academic questions, but then also my life as a Jesuit, you know, thinking that, um, that if I was going to be able to say or do anything that's reasonable in, um, in those questions that I had to, you know, get the training and, and the Jesuits said yes to it. One of my brothers called me, he had been in corporate America for quite a few years. I was about turning 40 years old when I began my full-time tenure track teaching position at uh, Fairfield U. And my brother called me on my first day and said, Frank, I wanted to congratulate you. You're just about turning 40 and you finally have a full-time job <laughs> and you're not in school anymore. So it was kind of a long, long but interesting road. But, but I also found that um, it made sense. Um, you know, and then it, it kind of opened many doors for me personally, just to be able to be with Fairfield U undergraduates for many years. And as I uh, worked at Fairfield, I also found that a major part of my work was with the faculty there, you know, being in dialogue with faculty. I was on the, pretty much ever since I had been there, uh, on the applied ethics, what do they call it? The applied ethics committee or something, council. But I, I worked a lot with David Schmidt uh, in applied ethics and developing programs and courses and, and with you know, some of the, the great uh, business faculty there and others. So um, I would say that uh, you know, it kind of worked out for me. But, but then I made a decision, by the way, um, uh, to after about, I guess about a, nearly a total of 25 years at Fairfield, if you count my Regency period, um, that I as I was getting a little older, I, you know, kind of felt that um, I kind of wanted to do something else. And, uh, and that's kind of how the China thing got going. But um, before, look, before we get to China, let me just make one comment and then ask you a question about Fairfield. Sure. The comment that I can't help but notice is your two majors as an undergraduate, economics and, and, and religion, you know, and that kind of has been your intellectual history uh, since your undergraduate years, the relationship between the two. Yes, but, I think so. But I'd like to, getting to your um, time at Fairfield, could you talk about some of the other highlights you have uh, during your 25 years at Fairfield? I know the applied ethics was uh, your love and a very important contribution, but just some other memories that you might have. Sure, Jim. Thank you for the question. And uh, first of all, I. Um, I really felt and still feel in many ways that Fairfield uh, uh, was and is my home uh, in the in the Jesuits in the U.S. And uh, um, if any Jesuits ever have a home, uh, I lived well. There's so many things I could talk about. I I lived in the residence halls for many years, as I know you did, Jim, as well. And I see Charlie Allen there is uh, a resident Jesuit for many years. I uh, many of us lived in the dorms, so. You know, a major part of my life um, uh, was at Costco Hall for many years, and then afterwards up at uh, Dolan Hall. Um, and um, I would first of all say just life with the students, you know, was just a, a wonderful highlight. Um, you know, life with the students outside of the classroom uh, in all the joys and, and celebration of that, and also some challenges. I you know, certainly remember on a number of occasions the tragic loss of some students. Um, I remember Alex Carrion, for example, who happened to be, was my student uh, who was in the Ignatian College program 
uh, who died suddenly in his sleep one night from some kind of, uh, I believe it was a heart uh, issue. Um, I also, another major highlight for me, I was kind of on the uh, ground floor, uh, one of the original um, persons, uh, faculty persons who was involved with the Ignatian Residential College. In fact, I, I um, was invited to kind of teach in that and taught in that for a good number of years. Um, you know, working with students who sort of kind of selected to be in that program, which, and they were just extraordinarily, extraordinary young women and men. Um, so I, the first thing I would say, Jim, would be the, uh, would be the Jesuits. Uh, I'm sorry, would be the students, you know, working with the students, both inside and outside of the classroom. Um, oh gosh, there's so many wonderful memories. Um, I, um, I would say another part of it for me was um, being close to New York City. Um, I think that uh, my father was born and raised in New York and I have family and friends in New York City. So I would, you know, jump on the train on the weekends and get into the city like many people at Fairfield. And I would say that was also kind of a highlight of my time at Fairfield as well. And, and often I remember early in my time at Fairfield, we would run programs for high school students and we would take them into events in New York. Um, the college, so-called college access program was something we did early on. I know I, I was doing that, um, uh, I think in the mid eighties. Um, I would also say um, working with um, uh, some of the questions around Jesuit mission and identity, as you know very well, Jim, you know, uh, I know when you were doing a lot of that work, uh, many Jesuits who worked in the university, like Father Allen, yourself, and others, you know, we would be involved often with in conversations with faculty and with staff. And I remember when Father Von Arx was president and when he came in, um, uh, we, you know, he kind of started pushing that question, I think, pretty hard. And, you know, there were lots of wonderful conversations and retreats, you know, weekend retreats and events with, uh, f uh, with uh, faculty. Um, and uh, yeah, there's so, there's so many things. And, and um, I, I would also say uh, working with my colleagues in the religious studies department as well was a really important highlight of my, first of all, they put up with me for so many years. <laughs> and then at one point, I uh, it, uh, probably because probably most of them didn't want to do the job. I remember at one point, they asked me to be the chair of the religious studies department. And, you know, so I was working kind of managing that department and the adjuncts in that department, and then working uh, with the administration and all. That was also kind of a highlight as well, I would say, you know, in a way, being able to serve my, my faculty colleagues in that way. Um, I think I spent a lot of time in meetings during those years. Uh, this was pre-Zoom. Uh, so all, most of those meetings were in person. And uh, I remember I served on the, uh, I think it's called the Undergraduate <phone rings> Curriculum Committee. And um, boy, I remember some of those conversations when conversations were heating up about uh, the core curriculum and everything in the early days, you know, and uh, so luckily I was not, <laughs> Uh, I was not part of the, those more, at least directly part of those more recent discussions where, you know, basically discussions around the core are really essential uh, in all universities. So, you know, I was involved in that early on. And um, um, so there are many highlights, Jim, but I would say ultimately working with the students, you know, I loved being with them in the classroom. Um, I loved being with them in the residence halls. Um, and, uh, you know, there was a sense of really being a Jesuit on the campus as well. I think one of the challenges I would just mention, I mentioned my little escapes to New York. Um, one of the challenges probably was, you know, being on the campus and you had to make a kind, I mean, in the sense of, that you had to make a conscious effort to get off the campus. And, you know, my whole world sort of was, you know, the classroom, the dormitory, the Jesuit residence, um, also saying masses, by the way, in Egan Chapel, I was pretty active in, uh, you know, doing that over the years. And um, uh, so one of the things I found to try to be healthy, or at least to try to stay 
healthy was to make sure I at least once a week kind of got off the, got off the compound. And um, so I would, you know, sometimes jump on the train and go into New York and, or go up to New Haven. I used to love the museums up in New Haven. And, uh, but, uh, and at that point, my mother and father were living down in South Florida. So I would, you know, get on a plane and go down to visit them a couple times a year in Florida. And, uh, but it just, you know, it was a wonderful, wonderful uh, time in my life, really, being at Fairfield. Let me just, uh, you talked about your, how much you enjoy being with students. I remember during uh, semester exams, how when you were living in Costco, how you used to go out and get donuts and coffee for them uh, to help fortify them to study for the evening. You know, I, I used to marvel you doing that. I mean, Oh, I thank you. I would go out, they would give me a budget. The university would give me a budget of, you know, whatever the number was. And so, um, so I would dutifully spend that, you know, running programs. I did feel a little guilty about that, Jim, basically plying the students with caffeine and sugar. And I, <laughs> I used to tease them that I would get larger numbers of them coming to the Dunkin' Donuts uh, study break social, uh, more of them coming to that than I would to mass in the, uh, in the lounge, you know, <laughs> so, uh, but uh, they, they were pretty good about coming to mass in the lounge too. Um, but um, yeah, I, it was a really nice way to, um, to meet the students during the exam period and to be with them, you know, kind of informally. And also it was kind of a nice way, especially at the end of the semester to kind of say goodbye to them. If, you know, if they were leaving the dorm, you know, or if they were graduating or, you know, moving to another dorm or whatever. Um, so it was kind of a nice uh, closure thing. So I tried to do it at least a couple times a semester and, uh, uh, they, they loved it. And I would go around and put up signs and everything. And of course they thought it was wonderful. I would, you know, like fill up the back seat of my car with a couple hundred dollars worth of, you know, those boxes of Joe and, you know, tons of donuts and stuff, but yeah, it was really fun. And, uh, but I did occasionally feel guilty about the caffeine and the sugar, but but uh, hopefully they didn't do that every day. Uh, but it was great. Let's move on. Let's move on uh, to China because I remember, in addition to the all your full time commitments there, just taking a course with undergraduates in the Chinese language, you know, and just how hard you worked at that. And so perhaps to say something about your interest in China, how you left Fairfield for China. And anything else you'd like to say about all that? Oh, well, thank you, Jim. Sure. Um, I've been interested in China for many years. I, I think in a way it kind of began initially with um, some of my visits to Chinatown in Manhattan uh, over the years. I would, you know, often I'd be alone and I'd walk through uh, Chinatown and I would see the um, the signs, the Chinese language on, on signs for stores and restaurants, et cetera. And I was kind of captivated by the visual uh, culture, the visual uh, language. But then also I, I found it to be this um, kind of other world that I felt really attracted to. There was a, I don't know whether it was the kind of Buddhist-like quality or the kind of inner quiet that many people from Asia kind of exude, um, there was a certain kind of um, spirituality and goodness ultimately that, and mystery I would also say that I experienced in the Chinese people. And um, I also became uh, initially fascinated with um, Chinese calligraphy, like when I would go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York and go into the China uh, galleries there, I would you know look at this calligraphy and most Chinese calligraphy is, um, you know, based on the characters of of uh, the Hanzi. They call it the uh, the the characters um, from the Chinese language, and many of those characters are actually quite ancient. Um, and um, so I began to um, just kind of on my own a little bit, you know, got some books and things, and began to study some of the characters. Um, and then I. Um, Maybe this happened, by the way, after I served as department chair, I had a little more time. So my dear friend, uh, Ji Wei Xiao, who is uh, still at uh, Fairfield University, she's a modern language professor in, uh, in Chinese language. She's um, 
uh, from Wuhan, China, originally. Um, I called her one day and asked if I could come over and speak with her and asked if I could maybe audit or take uh, her class uh, in Chinese language. So I began studying with her um, in, uh, in Chinese, uh, 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 the Chinese language, and, you know, it's kind of plotted along at it, I think, for a while. And then I, um, then I uh, had a sabbatical year come up, and I had the opportunity, um, I met this Jesuit, uh, 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 Stefan Rothlin, who's a Jesuit from Switzerland originally, who um, was working in uh, Beijing and in Hong Kong, and he worked in business ethics. And um, I, I became in, I got in touch with him, and he needed some help in Hong Kong. So I basically um, packed up and went to Hong Kong for about a year and a half on a uh, research sabbatical. And so, and I continued my studies in Mandarin while I was in Hong Kong. Although, of course, in Hong Kong, they speak Cantonese, uh, Guangdong Hua, they call it. But um, so I was working in, interestingly, I was working in this uh, business ethics organization in Hong Kong and also studying Chinese language at the same time. And uh, then I made some trips up into Beijing and in other parts of China. I have some friends who live in uh, Guizhou province of China in uh, near the city of, uh, well, actually in the city of Guiang, uh, which is in, it's kind of next to Sichuan province. It's in, uh, I guess you'd call it uh, Southwest China. And um, so anyway, my first introduction really to China was through this sabbatical year that I had uh, in, uh, based primarily in Hong Kong. And um, it kind of, um, and then I made some trips up into the mainland. I very much remember my first uh, visits into the mainland and I, I just loved it. I um, felt so drawn to it. And um, in fact, there was a Jesuit uh, originally from France who was a missionary. Uh, he died a couple years ago, uh, um, who he wrote in uh, Buddhism, a lot in Buddhism. Uh, his name was Christopher Cochini. Actually, he's very well known for some of the things he wrote in Buddhism. He used to uh, come to Hong Kong about one week uh, a month because his visa only allowed him to stay for three weeks. That's kind of how they, how he was controlled up there by the, anyway, I won't go into all that, but um, he told me that, um, he asked me how I felt after my first visit into the mainland. I told him I couldn't wait to go back and he started laughing and says, oh, I see Frank that you've now have the China virus, uh, meaning that uh, people who are interested in China, once you go there, the virus kind of gets into your body. By the way, not a virus to hurt you, like the virus we've been dealing with the past 14 months, but rather um, your interest and your love of China kind of increases uh, many times over after being there. And of course, I made friends there. And um, uh, and luckily, my you know, I kept speaking China trying anyway to speak Chinese. And it really helps a lot, of course, um, to be able to communicate uh, with people in their own language, of course. And so I kept trying, even though my tones weren't, weren't the best all the time, you know, I would just keep practicing and talking with people as often as I could uh, in Chinese. And um, anyway, so that's, that was my first um, kind of uh, 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 connection really in a serious way with China. And then I came back to Fairfield and, you know, was working at Fairfield for a couple of years. And then I would go back to China in the summers. And then Father Von Arx invited me to go over once or twice to, to uh, for, with a couple programs for Fairfield students over there. Um, and with Donka Lee, I think I went over a couple times with Professor Donka Lee from the uh, history department. That was mostly during the summers. And then after I would usually go down to Hong Kong after our program. But then kind of out of the blue, you know, at that point I was thinking that maybe I should do something different in my Jesuit life. And I, my prayer kind of was, well, Lord, I'm not sure about any of this. I mean, if you want me to stay at Fairfield, I have a wonderful life at Fairfield. And then I had a meeting with Father John Cicero, the provincial, um, and he asked me if I would be willing to go to Beijing because they really needed a Jesuit in Beijing uh, at the Beijing Center for Chinese uh, Studies. And he asked me this directly. And I, 
you know, I must say it was a little startling, but more when I think about it, it actually made sense. I mean, the Jesuits in China, in fact, Stephen Chow, who was just elected uh, the Bishop of Hong Kong, perhaps some of you have been reading about that. I know Stephen very well. Um, Stephen and others, you know, were looking for a Jesuit for the Beijing Center. Um, in fact, Father Jean Geinzer, um, who was there for many years, who I know Larry and Donna know very well personally, uh, was coming back to the U.S. after about 12 years in Beijing. So they really needed a Jesuit in Beijing. And I guess they were probably going down the list of American Jesuits who could possibly do it. And so the provincial asked me to go to Beijing. And, um, uh, you know, it's so funny when he asked me, I said, well, John, that's very interesting. How about Hong Kong instead? This was, by, by the way, before all the unrest in Hong Kong <laughs> and all the protests in the street. So uh, uh, John started wiggling in his chair. This was the provincial of the, uh, my province at that time. And he said, well, Frank, <laughs> I mean, I know you like Hong Kong, but we really need you in Beijing. So I said, okay, John, let me think and pray about it for a couple of days. So I called him and said, okay, I'm ready to go. And uh, within six, I forget when all this happened, maybe in January or maybe late fall. And then that summer um, I went to Beijing and, you know, for a long-term mission in Beijing at the Beijing Center for Chinese Studies. And um I, I think I spoke to many people at Fairfield about that experience of simply to say that it, in, in my prayer, I would say that it, I would say that the ultimate uh, part of that discernment really was, you know, those years of and experiences of being attracted to China and drawn to China. And I must say that I, <laughs> I still feel that, you know, if the Jesuits asked me to go back again, I, I love being here at the parish, but, you know, I, I think I'd go. Um, please don't tell Father Provincial that, at least right now. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, it's hard. I felt, I feel the, have felt and feel the, you know, the church really needs to be there somehow. It's very difficult. Um, but I would say that ultimately it had to do with this kind of mysterious feeling of attraction to the Chinese people and to their faith and to the church there, even in all of its struggle. And uh, um, I just, you know, and it, it, it was kind of, it's where I think I needed to be. And then of course I was over there and uh, that's a whole other story, but things got very complicated, of course, in China and the relations between the U S and China. And that's a whole long story, but so um Anyway, that's how I got there. I'd say it was uh, my attraction, my interest, uh, my confirmation in prayer, and then ultimately the direct uh, question of my provincial to go. And, um, you know, I felt that the good Lord was leading me there somehow. And, uh, you know, that's kind of how it happened. And, uh, uh, and even now- you'd still, be, you'd still be there if it weren't some, for some visa problems. I think so, yes. Uh, I would- very likely, Jim, still be there. Um, basically, the reason I came back after a little under two years, well, I probably spent a total of about three and a half years uh, in, in uh, China. Um, probably, if you count it all up, maybe about four years. Um, but um, basically, I'm pretty sure that, you know, the way that things are managed over there, um, basically, I had trouble renewing my visa. And I think part of that had to do with the uh, complex, uh, very tense relationship between uh, both the U.S. and China at that time, and also some things that were going on in the university where I was, uh, the, the, where the Beijing Center was located. And there were also some kind of inter-political uh, things going on in the Beijing Center for Chinese Studies as well. Uh, which was the, the Jesuit apostolate that I was asked to go to, to try to help. And, um, but yes, and, um, but it's a wonder, it was an absolutely wonderful experience. Difficult, but wonderful, I would say. And I'm still in touch with a good number of my uh, uh, people over there, my contacts over there. And um, so, yeah. Well, 
how did you get to Philadelphia, city of oh. brotherly love? Oh, great question, Jim. Thank you. Um, well, basically, John Cicero, when it became clear that I, I pretty much had to leave China, uh, I was in a, a conversation actually with Stephen Chow, the bishop elect of Hong Kong, uh, who studied in the U.S. and um, who's from Hong Kong originally. He, at that point, was my provincial superior in uh, in China. And then also, um, uh, you know, so with some other Jesuits over there. Basically, when it became clear that I had to leave, I had some communications and uh, with um, maybe even a phone call uh, with uh, John Cicero, uh, who was then the provincial of the province of the uh, recently merged New York and New England province. And John, you know, um, said to me, he said, Frank, you know, I know you've just had a very intense, um, complicated experience in China. He said, as a transitional period, what do you think about coming back to New York City to help at St. Ignatius Loyola Church in New York on the east side in the parish there? Uh, the parish here really needed a priest and I was available. At that point, I was still discerning my decision, you know, trying to decide whether I ultimately would return to Fairfield. Fairfield was very wonderful to me. They communicated that they wanted me to come back to the faculty. Um, I, my, I still had tenure at Fairfield. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Mark Nemec and uh, my colleagues in the department and uh, uh, Christine Siegel, the provost at that time, and uh, um, uh, I think, I think she may have been in the AVP at that time. I'm not sure what her exact title was, but anyway, they all wanted me to come back, but I wasn't sure if that was the right thing to do. Uh, so John Cicero and plus I was, you know, uh, you know, probably dealing with all kinds of culture shock and <laughs> all kinds of other things. Um, but, um, I came back pretty tired, but, um, uh, John asked me if I would go to St. Ignatius in New York and then I was there for maybe about four and a half, five months. And then, and John's, uh, the provincial office was right around the corner from the, uh, from the parish there, of course. So then I had a number of meetings with the provincial. And then we kind of came to the point that I still needed to some time to decide, you know, what I really wanted to do. And uh, I still kept, you know, I had my tenure still, but he asked me if I, I would accept a, uh, a mission in Philadelphia. At, Saint, at Old St. Joseph Church. And, uh, you know, I came down here for a visit. And um, so then I, that's kind of how I ended up here. I, I said yes to that invitation. And, and then it so happens um, this past January, the pastor of the parish here um, left the parish. And then since that time, they've asked me to uh, be the administrator of the parish um, uh, since then. So it's been very, very interesting. It's a wonderful parish, uh, uh, two blocks from Independence Hall in the old part of uh, the city and the old um, so-called um, old, well, I guess you would call it Society Hill and the old historic district of Philadelphia. It's a very old church. It was founded by the Jesuits in 1733. It's the oldest um, Roman Catholic church and the first Roman Catholic church in the city of Philadelphia, and actually probably one of the oldest churches in Catholic churches in America. Um, I think there are a couple others that are a bit older. Um, so this was one of the original Jesuit missions into uh, the city of Philadelphia. You know, it's funny, whenever I think about the church here, it was founded in 1733, and that was even before the United States of America was founded, you know, in terms of you know, 1776. So it has a very long, long history here. And it's a wonderful church, a very diverse community, um, uh, very interesting, interesting community. And uh, so I'm basically trying my hand now at uh, running a parish. And it's, it's a lot of fun, tough, to, you know, we're in the budget cycle right now. So we're trying to get the budget all lined up. But um, uh, doing a lot of preaching, a lot of work with parishioners and uh, we run a very uh, vibrant and active outreach program to the homeless here. We have a meal for the homeless uh, uh, three days a week. Uh, we do lots of other things with the homeless. Um, we uh, also have a hospital ministry here. Pencil University of Pennsylvania Hospital is a couple blocks away from us. So we uh, do a lot of work with uh, Penn Hospital. 
And uh, so I, I become a, uh, a parish priest now in a way and running this parish and uh, really interesting, uh, you know, very a tremendous amount of uh, involvement by lay women and men here. So in many ways, I often say that they're, they're allowing me to collaborate with them. You know, we talk a lot about Je Jesuit collaboration, but uh, uh, lots of great people in the community here. So it's been a lot of fun. And uh, it's very interesting being in Philadelphia too. And um, I, um, I can walk to the Chinatown in Philadelphia, which is about 15 minutes from here, uh, from the parish. And so there's great Chinese food um, uh, and uh, some, made some Chinese friends here. So uh, yeah, it's a wonderful city, but of course, it's also been a very difficult 14 months here, as I know it's been for all of you, um, you know, trying to figure out how to keep a parish going during the pandemic and, you know, adapting to all of the protocols for COVID and, and then financially trying to keep the parish going. Obviously, uh, whoever invented the idea of online giving, I, I really want to thank them, but we're basically okay. Many parishes who've not had uh, electronic uh, offertory, you know, contributions to the parish are in real trouble now financially, but we've been able to, our, the par parishioners here and our friends, the friends of the parish, uh, we also have something called the Historical Preservation Corporation, which I kind of run uh, uh, as the administrator, you know, because we have this very, very old, <coughs> excuse me, very old historic church. So we have a lot of obligations to keep the church, um, you know, going. And it's also, you know, a historical landmark, you know, it has all kinds of landmark restrictions on it and everything. So, you know, it's a very, very interesting place. I hope you come down to visit sometime. Be happy to give you a tour. It's a very beautiful church. I get the sense that you're energized by what you're doing there. Thank you, Jim. Yes, I am. I, I really am. You know, I came to, it was very hard for me to decide to you know, kind of conclude my work at Fairfield. It was just a wonderful and is still a wonderful part of my life. Um, but I, I felt that I was coming to the age, you know, um, if I didn't make a kind of, I, I also would say too, by the way, it wasn't, you know, um, as you get a little bit older, I don't know if I was ever good in the classroom, but uh, only my students maybe could say that. But, but I also, as you get a little older, you know, the students kind of, I would, I learned over the years teaching college students that about every three to five years, they go through some kind of major transition uh, or change. And I think for many years, I was getting that change. I was understanding them. And then there, my last couple of years at Fairfield, I think I was kind of a little bit at sea, quite frankly, understanding, uh, my new batch of students. And I think it was, it wasn't them, it was me. Um, I wasn't, I was, I was like their, I, I was old enough to be their grandparent, of course. And um, I loved them, but I also felt that, you know, um, that there, I wasn't as, um, quite frankly, I don't know if I was as sharp in the classroom as I was in my earlier days, you know. Um, and I, I was thinking that, you know, also I had a tenure position there, you know, maybe it would be great to let some other really good, hopefully some good, not I'm necessarily very good, but, but to let a younger person come in and teach them. And I also did have this, you know, calling, I think, to China and to other work. And so I think that ultimately led to the decision, but I think part of it was, um, um, you know, also, <laughs> uh, I know those of you who are teachers understand this, you know, teaching full-time undergrad, teaching full-time in a university. And, you know, it was, I was also feeling that um, I had to make, I, I, I was getting really tired, quite frankly. And I, I don't know if I was as sharp. And then all these other things were opening up in my life. And, uh, and so I decided, you know, and then of course, when the provincial asked me to go off to China, I think that was in a way kind of a confirmation for me that it was time to leave. But, you know, I think I would just say, Jim, quite frankly, um, I think one of the wonderful, many wonderful things of Jesuit life and uh, is that you have this opportunity 
an invitation often to do many different things in your life. And I feel that I've had that fortunately, and I've been very fortunate in my life, have had that experience where the Jesuits have asked me to do many different things. And then the Jesuits also enabled me to follow many of my own personal and academic interests. They basically just encouraged me, you know, along the way. And, and um, so um, I, you know, my time at Fairfield, I just feel tremendous gratitude uh, for, for my time at Fairfield. And, um, and uh, yeah, I'm really grateful and very happy. I, I felt like, I feel like I kind of left before, you know, I could have stayed there forever and then maybe they would have had to kick me out, you know, if I, you know, if I, you know, started getting such in the classroom that, you know, I just wasn't as sharp anymore, but, um, uh, and that wouldn't be good. So, uh, I felt, uh, you know, I kind of left after a good run there. I think I had a pretty good run and, uh, uh, left, uh, full of gratitude and, uh, you know, it's, it's just such a wonderful place. You know, quite frankly, a couple of my friends who are still professors, uh, I don't personally know how I would do with this online learning stuff. You know, it's so hard, uh, you know. And so I don't know whether the good Lord was drawing me out before the COVID pandemic, knowing that I would be a disaster <laughs> trying to teach on Zoom. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, I'm very grateful for Fairfield. I'll just bring this to an end and turn it back to Jessica, but with one comment. There's not a doubt in my mind that you would have mastered online learning and mastered it well like you've done everything else. Oh, really? Oh, thank you, Jim. Oh, so, you're very kind. Thank you. And Jim, if I could be so uh, direct and say, you know, seeing yourself and Father Allen and uh, Mary Francis and uh, Larry and Donna, you know, I miss so many of my Fairfield friends. Um, very uh, Janet and uh, Jessica, you know, I, as I say, I really am very fond of all of you and fond and George Diffley, uh, who I was with for many years at Fairfield, Joan Weiss, uh, so many uh, good, good people at Fairfield. Um, and uh, so, no, I'm, I'm grateful. So thank you, Jim. I, I, uh, you know, it's funny, I've been doing a hell of a lot of Zoom meetings, uh, you know, working in this role down at the past uh, 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 as the administrator of the parish. So, uh, you know, maybe I've learned a little something at that, but, but I'm, I'm really so grateful that to see you all here tonight and thank you for listening and thank you for, uh, being, uh, on, uh, with us tonight. So again, thank you. Now, Father Hanafi, we have just a few minutes left, but we've gotten a couple of questions. This first one is not about you. It's more specifically about China. So if it's something you would rather me connect you with the alumnus to discuss offline, just let me know that. But the question is, today, it is, is it more important for an individual to identify as a Han Chinese than to identify as a communist Chinese? Good question. Very good question. Um, I would, I, I'm not sure of the answer, quite frankly. I uh, certainly, the... Um, by far the majority of uh, Chinese people are of the Han, uh, Han ethnicity um, nu numerically. But quite frankly, I don't know. Um, I could say that, you know, um, there are quite a few people I know in China um, and have worked with um, who are members of the party. And, um, uh, but interestingly, that is, um, kind of a, um, it's not really talked a lot about in public, uh, I would say. I, I would say that, you now obviously if you're, you're working directly in a government position, you know, um, you know, many people are aware of, uh, you know, your, uh, your affiliation. Um, but I think that the primary, I think that the primary identification would be being Chinese. And I, I think interestingly, even that, you know, that happens um, uh, for people, for Chinese people in other countries as well. You know, I think of the Chinese people I meet like in Philadelphia, for example. Um, the one thing I would say also is that in a question like that, uh, which is a very good question, by the way, I would thank the person asking it. Um, when someone asks me like a, a broader, more general question, like what is it like in China? 
often one thing I would say uh, initially is um, like, which China do you mean? You know, the China of the big cities, uh, the China of the rural agricultural areas, um, the east, eastern coast part of China where many of the biggest cities are, uh, for example, uh, Beijing, Shanghai, uh, Hong Kong, um, and uh, Shenzhen, uh, which is the, a large, very large city where they make all our iPhones and iPads just north of Hong Kong. So um, I would say that um, I think the Chinese people are a very proud people. And, but the interesting part of it is um, the, there are many dialects in the language. So, so people, you know, identify, I think, more as Chinese. But, but what I would say, by the way, um, is China is a very diverse, extremely diverse society. Um, uh, regionally, uh, linguistically, uh, culturally, but I, I would say that I would I I don't know the exact number of people who I think this is public knowledge. I'm sure if you did a Google search, you could find a number. You know of what the um, what the identification with in, in terms of membership in the party. But I do think that people who reach a high level of kind of material and personal success in China usually are members. Um, and I think that usually helps, you know, in their kind of, shall you say, shall I say climbing the social ladder. But I would think my impression, I'm not an expert on this, but my impression would be the people primarily identify um, as being Chinese people. Right. And then the last question, uh, someone, it was actually your friends, Larry and Donna, wanted to know what your insights are into the recent rise in anti-Asian hate in society. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Larry and Donna. Um, first of all, it's very distressing, obviously, uh, in a, on a personal level. Um, the first thing I would say is um, misunderstanding dare I even use the word a terrible ignorance um, on the part of, of people who would obviously behave this way. Um, and obviously the violence um, part of it, the violence dimension is absolutely horrible and obviously illegal and a terrible uh, example of hatred really. But I would say, you know, um, that in many ways, and this may sound a little maybe surprising or shocking to uh, people here tonight or when I might say this to other groups, I think in many ways the Chinese people and the American people are more similar than they are different in terms of coming from uh, a highly successful, highly sophisticated uh, culture, um, an economic uh, powerhouse. Um, both countries are obviously economically and politically very important to the world and to the success of the world, really. Um, I, I do think that there's a been, there's a lot of rhetoric uh, the last five or 10 years that have taken place going back between both uh, societies, on both sides, really. And um, you know, it's funny when I was over in China and I would sometimes hear uh, some of the rhetoric in the Western media about China. And I would say that a large percentage of it is factually wrong or a lot of it, quite frankly, is propaganda on both sides, by the way. I would certainly say there's propaganda on both sides. I mean, there's clearly a, um, a competition now between both countries uh, on that is very serious and a very, uh, a very serious competition, uh, business-wise, obviously, economically, politically, culturally. Um, and I, I think the virus, um, some of the rhetoric, and actually, quite frankly, in my opinion, and I'm not an expert or a scientist on this, but I, but I, I think some of the things that were said about the origins of the virus. I don't know yet if, if those 
things that have been said rhetorically have been really shown scientifically to be true. And I probably shouldn't go into a lot of great detail. I think we all know what I'm talking about here, but um, I think um, some, uh, some of that is connected to um, quite a bit of mis, in my opinion, personally, uh, misunderstanding about the origins and sources of the virus. Um, and I don't think we know the facts on some of that yet. And I think, um, I, I, I don't, I, I think it's, um, I think part of it, let me just kind of maybe say one more thing. One of the reasons I, I think the, the Jesuits started the Beijing Center many years ago is to try to help um, and encourage cross-cultural cross understanding between uh, the People's Republic of China and the United States of America. Because I think most, I'm not an expert in this either, but most uh, analysts around the world say that that relationship is perhaps one of the most important relationships between any two countries in the world today for all kinds of obvious reasons. And I, I think that one of the things, one of the reasons I went to the Beijing Center is I think both countries need to understand each other better uh, because I think there's a tremendous um, a tremendous um, misunderstanding on both sides. And I think that one of the reasons is that, quite frankly, I think the Chinese people are better at, un at learning the English language than Americans are in learning the Chinese language. And uh, for, for all kinds of obvious historical reasons, but I really think America has a major task before it, quite frankly, right now, is to try to learn more about China. And, and that goes, that's also true for the Chinese people. But I, I, but I think that um, some of the uh, anti-Asian violence and uh, hatred, quite frankly, let's call it what it is, um, comes out of um, a misunderstanding. And I, I really hope and pray, uh, quite frankly, that you know, we can learn more about China and that China can learn more about us. And uh, um, the Chinese people are wonderful people. They are wonderful people. And, um, and uh, I think both countries, you know, certainly both governments of both countries say that, you know, they use the expression of win-win, uh, at least in business and economic relations. I, I think, you know, we have to do all we can to avoid direct conflict between both countries, uh, because that would be an absolutely absolute disaster for the world. Um, I think what we need is more understanding, a willingness for greater dialogue. Um, I'm sorry, this probably sounds like a pep talk, but I think really think that's partly behind uh, some of what's been happening recently, and it's it's heartbreaking, quite frankly. Um, that's probably a longer answer. Uh, Donna and Larry, than you maybe hope for, but that's the best shot I can give, at least at the moment. Oh, Bukuchi, Wohong Gao Xing. Larry, your Chinese is very good. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Father Hanafi. Thank you, Father Bowler. Thank all of you for being with us tonight. The next event in this series will be with none other than Father Charles Allen on June 15th. So keep an eye out. I will send the link to that when I send the email with the video link of the, of the recording out to all of you. So we hope to see you for that on June 15th. And thank you all again and have a great night. Thank you. Thank you all. Great to be with you.